Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to what will be a rather technical post about the Midlight, Midnight Library, a highly promoted book that copied far too much from my first self-published novel. So this book, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, um, was published in 2020 and my book was published in 2018. The author, Matt Haig, got an $800,000 advance from Canongate. This was published in an article uh, in, a, in the British press. He also published it with Penguin Random House, and he has been tweeting lately about how he sold the film rights and met with movie producers to discuss the appropriate actress for the lead role. Matt Haig has, on his website, he says he's sold over 5 million books. He has published children's literature and literature for adults. He seems to, in the work for adults, he seems to have a security worker perspective, writing from the perspective of a dog or from a, the perspective of a depressed man, that kind of thing. And in this book, he took on the perspective of a young woman, something that he does not, does not typically do. It doesn't really fit his style, but so that's, that was the first odd thing about this book that I noticed. And when I read it, I, it was absolutely obvious to me that he'd used my book as a template for this book. And I, I'm going to do a rather technical look at this. In other posts, I've described more of the circumstantial evidence about what's going on with this book. But here I'm going to focus just on what's between the covers of his book and my book. So there is a more over a, an overall structure of the book comes from mine and it can be outlined with 11 points. And these are all rather general. You would not be able to copyright the sequence. This is very general, but what is interesting is that the style of his copying was extremely consistent in that from each of these points, he took five very unique plot elements from my book and they were in sequential order and they matched on a page for page basis very often. So for example, you'd open his book to a similar page number and my book to a similar page number and approximately the same thing would be happening on each page. So these, these would, in the language of structuralism, you would call these 11 my themes. And each my theme consisted of a sequence of five plot elements that taken all together, you end up seeing that his book has copied a structure of 55 points directly from my book. So individually, none of these points are, are going to, you know, diagnose that this book has been plagiarized and there hasn't been any verbatim plagiarism. But he was clearly using a, either an outline of my book that had a very detailed structure or he had the book next to him and he was opening it and seeing what happens on this page and then writing a page in his book and then flipping forwards and saying what happens next and then writing what happens next in his book, but in his own style with a number of substitutions to disguise what he was doing. And I believe that the act of copying down this either this 55 point outline or this 55 point sequence within his book, I think this constitutes copyright infringement. So can I prove that Matt Haig created such a detailed 55 point outline? 
or that he had my book next to him while he was writing? I can't prove that directly. I mean, I wasn't sitting next to him. But um, because he might have purchased such a detailed outline, or he might have even purchased a software package that gave him writing points, writing prompts that basically fed him the plot of my book. But, you know, he didn't attribute an outline, he didn't attribute a software package, and he didn't attribute the use of my book. So I think he is still liable for copying even if he didn't attribute a writing assistant or outline source. One can only conclude that copying occurred after the fact based on the number of sequential plot overlaps copied. When it exceeds the capacity of human working memory, which is only around eight points in length, then we, we just we don't work with lengthy sequences when we when we think and we rely on writing things down in order to work with longer sequences. And when the sequence is long enough, it is clear that a certain mimetic structure didn't just stick in the author's mind and emerge spontaneously because human memory just doesn't accidentally carry around such lengthy sequences unless they've been stored deliberately within a memory palace or melodic structure but that's that's something we do and we have to we work hard to memorize something so if you want to memorize a sonnet or a song you really have to sit down with that and work hard to memorize it and that's a form of copying that can also be a create copyright infringement situations and we know that human memory works this way based on studies of human psychology and the genealogy of stories. So to understand how a book gets copied in, in structural plagiarism, you really have to have a sort of multidisciplinary understanding of how the mind works, how stories work, and how copying works. So now I'm going to get into the nitty gritty details of what this copy on each page. And clearly right now, I am violating someone's copyright. So I think I'll stop doing that now. Recall that none of this, I'm none of this is verbatim plagiarism that I'm talking about. It's much more like having a book or a detailed 55 point outline of a book sitting next to you as you write your version of a story that you want to steal. So this is going to, this is a very technical breakdown of the overlaps between our books. And you see the page numbers here and I will plot this out in a chart after I go through all of these so that you can see it both graphically and in terms of just hearing it um, spoken and uh, detailed. On the first page of both books, we learn that her young adulthood was marked by her father's sudden departure. She is a philosopher at heart and torn by her choice to leave or remain in her small town. She takes refuge from her broken family in a library or laboratory. In the case of my novel, she's not in love with the guy who wants her. He's a substance abuser who is going nowhere. Her job is so dissatisfying that she's barely holding on. Worries about career choice trigger her descent into suicidal depression in a multiverse madness. The madness starts when her life is endangered by a deliberate suicide in the case of Haig's book and accidental suicide in my book. In both cases, her demise was brought about by strong drugs that altered her state of consciousness. In the earliest version of my book, she literally took sleeping pills, just as in Haig's book. Both authors used a countdown to disaster format. And um, this is something you won't see in the version I published on Amazon, but in the version I sent around to agents, to literary agents, and that I published online, you can see that 
there's another a, an additional type of uh, structural overlap in that we each chapter was a countdown like 10 9 8 7 6 and in this this version too that I'm writing here she also writes a note to herself just like Haig does in his book she thinks about how she did what she wanted to do rather than what her mother wanted her to do which was get married to a local guy and then from here on out I won't refer at all to this version 2 everything from here on out only applies to the version I published on Amazon the print copy with the page numbers as published in that book so she passes out and when she wakes up she meets the quasi human ghostly female mentor who is intimately connected to the machine library that will serve as the central element of the story when she loses herself to the dream or madness she encounters a ghostly female mentor who seems to know everything about the machine library and these this character is used to structure and pace the story and within this my theme this uh, my theme number three you see that her appearance is sequential and but it's spread throughout the book so all of the other my themes are roughly as they they are they are in the same order in both books but this my theme is one that's sort of distributed throughout the book but um with this ghostly female mentor she tends to get non-committal answers about when she asks for advice about her career her family or her love life and the book concludes with a final discussion with this ghostly female mentor about whether or not she had free will in what had transpired so now we are at my theme number four where she is attempting to reground herself through explorations of the realistic life options she's chosen to avoid and so this my theme is somewhat out of sequence as in it seems like he took this chunk from my book and moved it to earlier in his story but the subsequence of five points is still sequentially or organized and this is the subsequence before completely and utterly losing herself to the multiverse madness she tries to reground herself by reaching out to a friend from her youth but it doesn't really help she doubts her connection to reality by thinking about a pretentious and academic concept related to identity both of the protagonists are rather pretentious and like to name drop the substance abuser she didn't want to marry wanted a baby but she didn't throughout the story whenever she gets upset or overwhelmed she returns to thinking about a specific song that calms her down her husband in one of her lives cheats on her and doesn't apologize this is expressed through a scene in the couple's bedroom where he is asking her to come to bed but she is upset because of his unrepentant infidelity and this sequence continues here she talks to herself in a mirror to try to get a hold on her identity she's lost in a maze of confusion and tormented by a cat chess is used as an analogy for life choices and the next choice she makes is motivated by the cat she ends up in a situation that centers around water on a metaphorical level it is a baptism of sorts washing away shame but even this doesn't solve her fundamental problems so at this point this copy and pasted material from later in my novel is re-merged with the original plot line that I used in my book by conflating two of the protagonists love interests so basically merging two characters who are re relatively similar in their function in the story so she meets a man who is also aware of his other lives in the multiverse he remembers a life in which they were married she doesn't remember being married to him at first and she decides not to pursue the relationship because she is distracted by her other possibilities now I was kind of sloppy here these page numbers apply to these three points as well 
this whole seg segment here is represented by these page numbers. Um, the ghostly mentor points out that she is always saying things that she doesn't really mean. So all of this is in sequence. As she dives deeper into this dream or madness, both protagonists use poetry and similar metaphors to express themselves. The appearance of poetry structures and paces the story, punctuating her low points. So you can see there are, it's really odd how the poems occur on roughly the same page numbers four times. That just seems really odd. A poem called Howl plays a central role in the plot of both novels. A black hole analogy is made and it represents the protagonist's sense of life's meaninglessness. She studies her reflection in a mirror as she tries to get a hold of her identity. Once again, I don't know, it's just weird. In Haig's book, the game of chess and quantum physics are each discussed approximately 19 times with, the res with respect to the multiverse she has observed. And whereas Haig offers a rather ham-handed interpretation of physics and philosophy, Hacker is an actual physicist, and you can see that in a, one of the larger chunks where physics is discussed, you, in philosophy, you get very close overlaps in the page numbers used. Next, we go into the protagonist's struggle with despair. They both, both protagonists in Matt Haig's uh, book and my book, end up in a really crappy apartment with a loser roommate who plays video games. And she creates poetry in this environment in both books. In some of her lives, she is followed by a cat, and toxoplasmosis is discussed with respect to its impact on human intelligence. Now, toxoplasmosis does not appear in very many novels, so this is rather odd, and that it appears on a similar page number. And then we have descriptions of how elites deliberately kill people by taking over their minds. That comes shortly after. Then she thinks about how her father's departure occurred because she did what she wanted to do rather than what he wanted her to do. She then looks, studies her reflection in a mirror as she tries to regain her sense of self. And this happens a couple of times in both stories in similar locations. The protagonist realizes that you can't get everything you want. There are trade-offs. She struggles with her mother's death and her parents' relationship in a sunny poolside environment. She has to give a lecture at a big conference and it shocks the audience with claims about the multiverse. She finds her life as a scientist uncomfortable and dangerous. She's almost killed while doing her scientific job. She spends time discussing physics with a strange man she finds odd, yet oddly attractive. In one of the two implied sexual situations in the book, the protagonist pounces on the scientist she finds odd, yet oddly attractive. And it doesn't lead to anything serious because he's kind of nuts. So at this point, the subsequence that I was describing earlier, it merges with the main sequence when she meets a man who is also aware of his other lives in the multiverse. He remembers a life in which they were married, and she doesn't remember being married to him at first. She decides not to pursue the relationship because she is distracted by her other possibilities. And this is these are the two things that kind of get conflated in his version of the story. And it's easier to see how he did this when all of the page numbers are charted out on a graph, which I do, do a bit later. So now we come to my theme number 10 of 11, and she loses her grounding and is made unhappy by extreme situations. She struggles with rock star-like fame and people she doesn't like or know wanting her on a stage. 
The climax is expressed with lyrics from a complete song and a conflict with the mentor figure. She dreams of a gentle life at one with nature and dogs, but doesn't get what she expects. She dreams of a life with status, but doesn't get what she expects. She then disappears into an obsession with sampling her other lives, and she sort of gets lost in that. So she thinks she has it all figured out at this point. Well, when she, at a certain point, when she becomes very immersed in an ideal life involving a family, a daughter, and a dog. And it's, she's trying to figure out the puzzle of how to be happy, and she thinks she's almost got it. She's almost losing herself in this life. Um, almost, she begins to remember things and merge in a life that she really likes, almost forgetting her real life when she's suddenly shocked back into her real life when her connection to the magical machine library breaks. She has an epiphany about self-acceptance that makes her grateful for her real life with all of its uncertain possibilities. She communicates her epiphany to the world and becomes famous, but doesn't let the fame get to her head. The female mentor librarian makes one last appearance before she heads out into the unknown, leaving the machine library far behind her where it won't ever bother her again. Now the bit about fame seems to be in a version of Haig's book that was only available to early reviewers. And since I've only seen comments on this particular plot element from a subset of reviewers, I would really like to get my hands on this earlier version of the manuscript. So, and if you plot these out, you can see that the sequential nature of these page overlaps shows that, is, is um, illustrated by how they're all roughly on this diagonal line. Whenever they're on a, this diagonal line, the same thing is happening on roughly the same page. And for example, the appearance of the ghostly female mentor, it happens at the same point at, in both books. And the appearance of poetry also occurs on the same pages in both books. It's just rather unusual for that to happen. It doesn't happen in other books like that by accident. There were a few elements that were difficult to fit into a clear sequential order. The black hole and mirror plot devices were used to communicate a lost sense of meaning and identity. And the chess and quantum devices show how she tries to use brute force logic to sort through her emotional problems. She tries to solve her problem by exploring other lives through imagination, but this also doesn't work. She only finds peace by embracing the allure of the unknown, heading out into the unknown in both books at the very end. So the fact that not everything is in a perfect sequence doesn't mean that copying didn't occur. You know, most people can still easily read a sentence or a word if the letters or words in the middle are completely jumbled because the human brain is very good at inferring meaning from external context. And I think that my book was used as a resource in two passes. In the first pass, the focus was on the whole book. And in the second pass, the writer zoomed in on a shorter section of what I wrote in the latter half of my book, and he took that section and pasted it to earlier in the book. And this was a rather lengthy, I believe, 10-point sequence. These were 10 unique plot elements, one after the other. So, if you think about how a song is copied, this is what a song would look like if you took a verse from later in the song and moved it to earlier in the song. I mean, it's still clear that you copied the song. Children are taught in school that if the book you are using as a resource needs to be next to you while you are writing, 
you need to cite it as a source, otherwise you are plagiarizing. Copyright does not, of course, cover ideas, but it does cover the expression of ideas, and that expression is defined by sequences and rhythms. When the sequences are long enough, a crime has been committed, and the length of the sequences Haig has copied is such that he couldn't have done this without having my book sitting next to him as he typed, or without having a very detailed 55-point outline of my book sitting next to him as he typed. If I compare my book to Michel Ende's never-ending story, which there are some similarities, I can find a few overlaps, but not 45 or 55. Um, so here are the overlaps with my book. And You see, there are only nine. She loses a parent and takes refuge in a bookstore, or in my case, a laboratory. And in Matt Haig's case, it's a library. She has a wise, ethereal female mentor, the Empress, the librarian, or Ariel. The story is about her battle against the nothing, the regrets, or despair. Despair claims the horse, the father, the mother, and threatens the protagonist's life. She gets lost in a labyrinth of doors, books, or possibilities, who discovers that he can place himself within various storylines, using this power to experience his or her wildest dreams. The more invested he becomes in a storyline, the more he forgets of his real life, almost losing his life to get altogether. The book ends with a discussion with the bookstore owner, or the librarian, or the female mentor. And so these elements are common to my book, Haig's book, and The NeverEnding Story. And this clearly happened in my case because I saw this movie when I was a child and it must have made an impression on me in how I understand how human psychology works because this is sort of a mix between psychology, the real world, and a story told by Michel Ende. It kind of struck a resonance and caused me to remember a lengthy sequence of eight or nine elements. But what doesn't happen is that you strike a resonance and suddenly accidentally remember 55 elements all at once. That just doesn't happen in a, a human brain without intensive memorization and effort. So now if I do the same comparison of Matt Haig's book with Enda's book, just not with my book, only the overlaps between The Midnight Library and The Neverending Story, I find a much longer list of overlaps. And this suggests to me that Matt Haig basically spliced in a few genes from the never-ending story into my book's plot, my genome, in order to make his work look more distinct from my book, even though he copied way too much from my book. He gave a kind of a coating of paint to disguise what he'd done. This method of cop of, of genetic manipulation is not a natural genetic crossbreed where you take two, for example, sequences of eight plot elements that you remember from books you've read a long time ago and you kind of mix them and mesh them together. But this is more like genetic modification or CRISPR technology, sort of genetic manipulation of a story that was produced organically within a human mind my mind, rather than within a copy-paste petri dish. So my, my story is, was formed by mixing a lot of stuff together in my own head, but Haig was using assistance, like using an outline, using a sort of copy-paste petri dish, and Whenever you hear the word copy, you know, if he's copying down my book in an outline, that's already copying. That's copyright infringement. You're not supposed to do that. So this list of 
overlaps with the Neverending Story and Matt Haig's book is significantly longer than the list of overlaps with my um, book and between my book and the Neverending Story. So I had nine or eight. He has 13. And he has 55 overlaps with my book, which is just too many. And what's interesting is that not all of these eight elements are, well, okay, getting off track. So how many points in a row must be copied before a legal red line is crossed? In, is it 10, 20, 30, or 40? In the case of J.K. Rowling versus Tanya Grotter and the Magical Double Bass, the number was 14. But if you go back in time to, say, the early 1980s, there was a period of time when people were much more strict about copyright and a smaller number was used. But since the Wild West of the Internet has taken over, the standards have almost gone out the window and we're only now just trying to bring them back online so that we don't have a complete lack of law and order and fairness because this is just unfair. It's not fair that he took my book and made a million dollars from it. It's just not because when he uses this plot and if somebody picks up my book, they'll say, oh, I've, I've seen this story before. He's taken the sparkle away from my, my work. So to me, it looks like Haig took a 50, 55 plot events in order from my book and gave the story a thin coating of paint, replacing the machine in my book with a library in his book to make the story look more like Michel Ende's children's classic. And to avoid a charge of copyright infringement, I think Haig must demonstrate that he has added new ideas to the work and not just ripped off the idea sequences present in other works. Synthesizing idea sequences can be considered to be a new idea, but man, one must attribute the sources or else run afoul of copyright law. So if he had said, I am using the never ending story as my resource, as a resource, and I am making a satire of Kirsten Hacker's work. You know, he might have actually been able to defend that if I wasn't, you know, really angry about it. <laughs> but because he even, he wrote that he had never seen my book before when he was confronted about the overlaps. I think he made a big mistake. And even if somebody handed him the outline of my story and said, hey, write this up, that's also not okay. He should ask, where did you get this? Where did this, which book did this come from? You know, it's part of the responsibility of an author. In general, I think it would be a pity if German children were tricked into picking up a Britain's thin, one-dimensional version of Michel Ende's classic story instead of getting the real thing. So I think he also copied too much from Michel Ende's book. And I think it would be especially a pity if they grew up attributing the story to an author with bad habits. And this link here goes to an analysis of his previous book, How to Stop Time, and how similar it was to a book by Claire North named The First Fifteen Lives of Henry August, August, or Harry August, yeah. In researching Michel Ende's classic, The Neverending Story, I learned that the manipulators are the power behind the nothing and Mork's masters. Their goal is to destroy Fantastica in order to replace fantasy with lies to manipulate and control the human race. And this reminds me of how modern entertainment has replaced fiction, or fantasy, with reality TVs and Twitter TV, you know, lies. And we are given the impression on the internet that all of these thought leaders on Twitter and on Facebook and Instagram, that they're 
that they're somehow real, but they are often very fake. It is my impression that Matt Haig is part of a very manipulative media apparatus. He acts as a sort of Twitter cult leader with 500,000 largely fake followers. He tweets and thousands of bots cheer. Children watch and grow confused. So I think that this is not just a small case of theft. This is a symptom of a much larger problem that people are not being sold authentic products. They're being sold manufactured fraudulent work that has often been stolen and it's not okay. Thank you for listening. Um, please tune in to my next videos. I will move away from this very technical, detailed approach and go back to my more entertaining um, storytelling approach. So thanks for, thank you for bearing with me. Until next time.